Hello and welcome to everybody uh, for our expert panel webinar, Protect, Produce and Prosper, Australia's Sustainable Ocean Economy. My name's Phil Curry. I'm the uh, political editor for the Australian Financial Review and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of this Canberra area, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Now, this webinar um, will run for about 90 minutes. It's being held to mark the global launch of the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economies, Transformations for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. The panel is an initiative that comprises the leaders of 14 nations, including our Prime Minister, the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and it's come together to chart the course for a sustainable ocean economy in the future, which uh, faces many challenges, as we're all aware. The panel's transformations outline, sorry, trans outlines how the world can make a rapid transition to a sustainable ocean economy across five areas, five key areas. They are ocean health, wealth, equity, knowledge and finance. Uh, tonight, as well, you'll hear from our Minister, the Australian Minister for the Environment, uh, Honourable Susan Lee, as well as leaders in sustainable seafood, Indigenous guardianship and equity, ocean and atmospheric science and sustainable fi finance about the opportunities and the challenges for our sustainable oceans economy. The intention this evening is not to discuss every aspect of the transformation, but to consider how the global framework translates to our regional and national context across a subset of issues. The first half hour of tonight's proceedings will be presentations uh, from each of our five panellists, who I ask to keep to five minutes each, and that will be about an area of transformation. And the second half of tonight's session will be uh, question and answers. At the end of tonight's webinar, we'll play a video from the panel leaders talking about the transformation. So if you could, kindly stick around for that. So we'll kick things off straight away. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, and Ocean Panel member, who will begin with a three minute recorded message. Thank you. G'day, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part in today's discussion. Today we've released out Transformations for a Sustainable Ocean Economy Framework. It sets out a bold but achievable plan to utilise the oceans in a sustainable way. Australia is the world's only single nation continent. As a people, we are literally defined by the ocean. As our anthem says, our home is girt by sea. 85% of us live within reach of the ocean. We rely on it for recreation, tourism, fisheries, trade, and of course, transport. Ocean supports almost 400,000 jobs in Australia. By 2025, we expect ocean industries to contribute $100 billion to our national life every single year. Each year, millions of Australians and people from around the world marvel at the rugged beauty of our coast and the amazing diversity of wildlife within our oceans. And though we benefit from the ocean, we understand we have a great responsibility to it as well. A stewardship. Right now, the ocean is under pressure. Habitat loss, plastics, pollution, overfishing, and of course, climate change. Putting at risk so much. Australia is already working hard to support our ocean industries and to ensure our ocean is clean and healthy. We've made big investments to protect our coral reefs. We're banning the export of plastic waste. We've declared more than one third of our national waters as marine parks, well above global targets. And 100% of the fisheries managed by the Australian government have a sustainable management plan. But we do need to do more. And that's why ocean panel leaders have committed to manage sustainably 100% of the ocean within our national waters. And to do that, we will develop a sustainable ocean plan for Australia that will guide us and our actions out to 2025. Our plan will outline how we will achieve a sustainable ocean economy with waste and marine park management, sustainable fisheries, safe and efficient maritime transport, marine biosecurity and offshore energy production. Now, this isn't a question of choosing priorities between all this, because I know when we protect our ocean, we protect both our environment and our economic growth. One serves the other. It's that simple. Our sustainable ocean plan will be part of the solution. And I look forward to seeing your findings on how the transformation framework can help us chart a course for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Prime Minister. Uh, and we'll get moving straight away. I'd like to introduce uh, a gentleman who probably needs no introduction, Dr Russell Reichelt, who will provide some scene-setting remarks. Dr um, Reichelt uh, is our ocean, our ocean panel Sherpa. Um, over to you, Russell. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. But in paying my respects to Indigenous Elders, the past, present and emerging, I acknowledge that the first Australian's connection to the sea goes back 65,000 years. It's the world's oldest living culture. And today we have a lot to learn from them. The 14 Ocean Panel members come from very diverse uh, cultural, geographic and economic circumstances. They've come together voluntarily. They describe how we can transform the current ocean economy into a new sustainable one. Their statement, the transformations for a sustainable ocean economy, has an important subheading, a vision for protection, production and prosperity. Our speakers will give you insights into why the ocean is our health, our wealth, our origin and our future. There are 700 million people living in these 14 countries. These world leaders manage 40% of the world's coastlines, 20% of the world's fisheries and 20% of the world's shipping fleets. The new transformations framework recognises the growing pressures on the ocean health, especially from effects of climate change, overfishing and declines in water quality. They also see that there are significant barriers to building this sustainable ocean economy, but their message is that there are practical solutions, that actions we can take now, and there are new partnerships already forming to deliver on this agenda. So why is the ocean important for Australia? Our exclusive economic zone is much larger than our land area. All our major cities are built around maritime trading ports. And our, as the Prime Minister has said, we have high value productive fisheries, very valuable recreational commercial tourism activities, which are interconnected with our beautiful beaches, our rocky shores, coral reefs, um, and deep ocean. It's clear that to realise the opportunities of a sustainable ocean economy, we must invest in protecting and restoring the ocean. When we restore the ocean health, for example, through restoring mangrove, seagrass, shellfish reefs, coral reefs, we're protecting biodiversity. At the same time, we're improving water quality and we're providing protection of coastal communities from extreme weather events. But the ocean panel leaders have been clear that we need to deliver these transformations through cooperative ocean action by all coastal states. And we need to do it now at pace and scale. Now, what do I mean transformations? Um, what types of things are being considered? Well, you'll hear more from the panel members on these things, but the panel does identify exciting opportunities across those areas of health, wealth, equity, knowledge and finance. And um, I think we, we, it's a very big agenda. As Phil has said, uh, we can't cover it all. But the thing about these transformations is the most rapid, powerful and positive transformations will be those that are connected to all five elements at once, taking us from just not a plodding incremental change, but together and multiplying to have rapid uh, exponential transformations. To give you just two examples, in future, offshore ocean-based renewable energy and innovative engineering, including machine learning, will combine with best practice ocean food production, especially in low impact aquaculture. Work has already started at the Australia's Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre, which began in Tasmania last year as a $370 million international partnership initiated with a $70 million federal grant. And second example is through our national hydrogen strategy, I can also see Australia in the future producing increasing volumes of cheaper zero carbon fuels powering maritime transport fleets that link us to the world markets. Now, what's different about this agenda? Have we heard this before? And why is now a great time for these transformations to make a difference? Public awareness is increasing in regard to the state of oceans health and of the environment more generally. And I think perhaps informed by rapidly improving science and technology, and even driven recently by tangible impacts on all of us from climate change and the pandemic. There's a growing acceptance that humanity is part of nature, not separate from it. This is something our first peoples have known forever, by the way. And the investment landscape is also changing. Financial decisions to support these transformative actions will see a continuing rise in innovative finance, consideration of equity, public benefit 
returns, along with systems of natural accounts being factored into investment decisions. Now is the right time for a transformation to a sustainable ocean economy. Thank you, and back to you, Phil. Good on. Russell, thank you very much. OK, we'll go now to our five panellists and our first uh, our first uh, area, uh, sorry, first, first area of discussion is ocean health, and that will be discussed by our Minister for Environment, Susan Lee. So, uh, Minister, how important is ocean health um, for a sustainable ocean economy? It's absolutely critical, Phil. Can I uh, welcome everybody on the broadcast and say thank you for joining us? Can I particularly add my acknowledgement and respect to First Australians across the landscape from wherever you are joining us and note as Environment Minister the deep and personal connection that our First Australians have with our land and sea country, something that Bruce Pascoe called in his book Dark Emu, the Aboriginal people's profound obligation to land and sea. It is indeed a pleasure to join you and I want to congratulate the 14 Ocean Panel leaders, our own Prime Minister among them, for their leadership and for the release of the Transformations document. I've been really fortunate to meet with so many scientists, land managers, traditional owners and tourism operators to understand the pressures of climate change, plastic pollution and all the challenges faced by our oceans. I've witnessed the impacts of coral bleaching and cyclones on areas of the Great Barrier Reef, just as I've witnessed the amazing beauty and the incredible array of marine life that remains the overriding story of this natural wonder. As part of the Australian Government's $1.9 billion investment supporting the reef and the reef economy, we're developing world-leading climate adaptation and reef resilience strategies. We're working with farmers, we're working with landholders, we're working in a practical way to protect water quality with traditional owners in controlling crown of thorns starfish, and we're protecting critical marine areas from illegal fishing. And Phil, you asked about ocean health, and we all know intrinsically that it is important, but we've got to be able to really understand that, really be able to measure it and really be able to monitor it. It's impossible to overstate how much a healthy ocean is the foundation of a sustainable ocean economy. The ocean is home to 50 to 80% of all life on Earth. It absorbs 30% of carbon dioxide emissions and produces half the Earth's oxygen. It shapes our climate and weather. It provides us with natural resources. It provides food for half the world's population, supports entire industries and generates millions of jobs. But it's a source of inspiration, spiritual connection and human well-being. But it is under pressure. The impacts of climate change, pollution and overfishing are all too real. Climate change is increasing ocean temperatures and altering oceanic currents, and that is driving changes in the distribution of species and higher acidity levels. The projection that we all hear of, that by 2050 we could have more plastic by weight in our ocean than fish, terrifies us all. And it does reinforce Australia's drive to tackle plastic pollution and transform our recycling capabilities. We're working closely with our Indo-Pacific neighbours. We're supporting regional ocean health through the conservation and management of blue carbon ecosystems, such as mangroves and seagrasses. Through our leadership of the International Partnership for Blue Carbon, we're helping Pacific Island countries tackle single-use plastics and developing a, pl a pilot ocean waste account in Samoa, as an example. Domestically, we have one of the largest networks of marine protected areas, as the Prime Minister mentioned, covering 37% of our marine jurisdiction. And we have, of course, that natural wonder, the Great Barrier Reef, generating 64,000 jobs, contributing an estimated $6.4 billion annually to the national economy. We're deeply committed to this protection. Climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. We're working with international partners in the International Coral Reef Initiative to champion the preservation of coral reefs and associated ecosystems worldwide. We're investing in new technologies to reduce emissions. We're committed to meeting and exceeding our Paris targets as part of the global response in the face of a changing climate. Through the $443 million Reef Trust Partnership, the Morrison government is investing $100 million in science-based interventions to support the reef in resisting, adapting and recovering from the impacts of climate change. Now, plastic pollution in our ocean 
So something that starts on land. That's why we're taking responsibility for our own waste and reducing the impacts of plastic pollution. And the plastic ban that will come into effect over the next few years is a vital part of that. But we're also working to tackle the impact of ghost nets and plastic litter in the waters and on the beaches of the Gulf of Carpentaria. Ghost nets, been described to me very accurately by traditional owners in Kakadu recently as walls of death. They entangle our whales, sharks, dugongs and turtles and they condemn them to slow suffocation. We've committed $14.8 million to start to address this challenge, improving the health of our ocean and reducing the threats to marine life and boosting the work of our Indigenous rangers. Protecting and cleaning up our marine ecosystems is not enough to safeguard ocean health. We need to restore these ecosystems. So we're doing many things, including investing to restore shellfish reefs in 11 locations across Australia. 90% uh, of Australia's shellfish reefs have been destroyed, but we can put them back, creating employment opportunities and better marine habitat. The Prime Minister talked about the Ocean Panel's commitment to develop a sustainable ocean plan. Australia's plan is an opportunity to recognise what's working well and identify areas where we can work in partnership with other governments, ocean industries and communities to improve the health of our ocean and support a sustainable ocean economy. So I do look forward to the conversation this evening and the insights of my fellow panellists. Once again, thank you. Well, thanks, Minister. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, David Carter to talk about uh, the second topic tonight of ocean wealth. Uh, amongst his many achievements, uh, David is the CEO of Austral Fisheries, and that was uh, the first fishing company in the world to go carbon neutral. So, uh, David, um, could you share with us, please, your vision for the future of sustainable fisheries, and where should we be in that context by 2050? Thanks very much, Phil. You're stealing my thunder already. Um, I'd kick off by acknowledging uh, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, um, traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I speak to you today, and I pay right, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I think as our previous speakers have said, um, we need not trade off healthy oceans for wealthy oceans. Uh, clearly one supports the other and as, as wild fishers, uh, sort of last of the hunter-gatherers, uh, we see firsthand the changes that are, are, are occurring in nature um, and at the same time understanding the critical importance of these fully functioning ecosystems. Uh, we benefit from working in a strong rights-based fisheries management regime with a mature market-based economy that demands a return on capital and it's through this lens that we consider the work of the high-level panel and reflect on the critical mix of challenge and opportunity that lies ahead. Uh, for Austral Fisheries, our journeys helped over the years deliver um, on the economic challenge of overcapacity in the northern prawn fishery, tackled the scourge of Ill illegal fishing in the sub-Antarctic, embraced third-party sustainability certifications like the Marine Stewardship Council, and more recently confronted our concerns around climate that has resulted in us becoming the first carbon neutral fishing company yeah, in the world, as we said earlier. Uh, we've also taken the extra step of working with uh, an organisation called Open SC to provide a technological solution to be authentically transparent and allow our products to be fully traced. We've done all of this because we feel it's the right thing to do uh, and, and equally that it makes good business sense. Um, we um, uh, indeed evidence would suggest that doing the right for communities and the environment can in fact enhance shareholder value. So it's through our brands and the storytelling allowed by these brands that we hope to unlock the value of our values. Uh, the report from the high level panel rightly focuses on the need for transformational change. Business as usual or evolutionary change will not get us where we need to be as we gear up for a world where by 2050, there could well be close to 10 billion of us um, increasingly uh, needing to be fed from uh, a planet that's uh, not in good shape. Uh, for me, these challenges suggest that the past will prove to be a poor guide for the future as we work to juggle the need to both use and protect our oceans. We need to be acting with urgency and be prepared to back our judgment and take a few more measured risks. My personal commitment is to highlight the importance of climate action and the need for rapid decarbonisation of our economy. As a business, we, are, uh, we were delighted this year to take delivery of um, 
Australia's first hybrid electric fishing vessel. Uh, this is something of a first for Australia. And whilst uh, this is good, um, and I am confident that we have the tools to manage fisheries sustainably, I believe that we cannot claim to be truly sustainable whilst we rely on non-renewable sources of energy. This has to be a huge opportunity for Australia as we bring our natural endowment of renewable energy potential together with a wealth of shipbuilding, engineering and operational expertise. Uh, on the water, our work uh, jointly with Sea Shepherd on tackling illegal fishing in the Southern Ocean has helped to all but eliminate the last of the illegal fishing fleet that in one case saw us a, in a joint operation in a chase for the illegal vessel, uh, the FV Thunder. This unlikely partnership raised eyebrows at the time, but has gone on to other cooperations in support of greater ambition on climate and work with uh, marine ocean plastics, as well as um, ongoing fight against illegal fishing. Uh, if we look globally, the main lost opportunities of fisheries uh, in fisheries are from over-exploitation and illegal fishing in waters, mainly along shorelines in developing countries. In some of these countries where catch from illegal operators can be as high as 40% of all catch landed, um, there has been significant damage to fish stocks, uh, lost um, commercial opportunities, and of course, impact on local fishers. Uh, sea Shepherd now work with local government agencies in these jurisdictions uh, where they help train fisheries officers, enable enforcement and compliance with local laws and deliver real results at a very low cost. Uh, I offer this example as a way of highlighting the importance of collaboration and the more, uh, this is another uh, one of my views, but the more unlikely and unexpected the collaboration, um, the greater the impact. My vision for fisheries out to 2050 is uh, definitely a bit of a shopping list of wishes. Um, by then, we're certainly all totally powered by renewable energy. We've eliminated illegal fishing and put Sea Shepherd out of, uh, out of business. Um, and none of our fish stocks are over-exploited. Uh, we provide our customers with high quality product from a supply chain that is totally transparent. And as a result, we are rewarded with price premiums for doing the right thing. We use all of the fish that we catch and our reputation as a safe, exciting and important industry is such as to attract the best and brightest young talent. As a final thought, um, I believe that we need to remain curious. Technology offers us unprecedented opportunities to reduce waste, monitor the world, automate our operations, connect and inform, reduce our impact on the oceans and feed the world. Being curious ensures that we remain flexible and open in our thinking and therefore better able to respond and take advantage of each new challenge. Thanks, Bill. Terrific, David. And, uh, very, very noble goals for 2050. I hope, I hope you're right. I hope we get there. Um, so our next, our next topic is ocean equity, and that will be addressed by our speaker, Joe Morrison. Uh, Joe has Dagoman and Torres Strait Islander heritage and over 25 years' experience working with Indigenous people in Northern Australia and more recent, recently with Indigenous people globally. Uh, he's the Managing Director of Six Seasons Advisory, which provides expert advice uh, for Indigenous futures. Uh, so, Joe, to kick off, could you tell us how, how does Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's guardianship of country relate to the recent discussions about sustainable ocean economy and, and how do we bring these, these things together? Thanks, Phil. Um, and firstly, I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge the other guests and, and panellists and other Indigenous people on this. Uh, as you said, I am Dugaman and Mwilgal from Northern Australia, and I'm joining you all from the lands and waters of the Watawarung in southern Victoria. The notion of ocean equity is consistent with Indigenous views about our place in the world. People are central, and it is critically important that the place we leave our children and their children encompasses people into all facets of a sustainable ocean economy. The importance of ocean equity for Indigenous people is paramount to ensure that the shackles of the past do not hinder our identity, growth and contributions into the future. The ongoing traditional connection that Australian Indigenous people have with their country, as many other speakers have already alluded to, is an asset for this nation and to developing a prosperous society for all Australians in the global community. It is important to have an understanding and appreciation of the importance and value of this deep connection. We Indigenous Australians, as with other Indigenous people around the world, believe that people 
land and water are intrinsically entwined. That is, that there is no separation between them. The ocean connects us around the world from country to country in the same way that our creators travel from our neighbour's country through ours and onto the next people's country. For those Indigenous peoples whose estates encompass the coasts and ocean and regularly identify as saltwater people, the coasts and ocean spaces are a fundamental part of our identity, our customs, our economy, and also for spiritual nourishment and the places of song and ritual. Therefore, it is fitting that, uh, that management of the ocean will have an approach that is inclusive of Indigenous peoples' participation in shaping the future sustainability of our oceans, adopting a free, prior and informed consent approach. But we Indigenous Australians have lived here for at least 65,000 years, and our knowledge, language and customary practices are as relevant today as they were when the first Europeans arrived. Our oceans include places, sites, spaces, reefs, currents, winds, tides, plants and animals and many other features that make our ocean spaces bioculturally rich and critically important for us as distinct peoples. We know our oceans and we know what they contain. Oceans have provided food for sustenance, including as a source of food for Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Many of our communities live in poor socioeconomic situations, but combined with our knowledge and geographical location, we are in many circumstances the best place to ensure the sustainability of ocean food. Many species are our totems and it is not just our obligation to ensure sustainability, but also to be included in the ongoing management and sustainable use of those resources. Ability to access traditional food assists in the health and well-being of our people, as well as providing a path to pass down our knowledge to the next generation and to keep our culture alive. Food systems offer us hope that our traditional foods can also, if so chosen, allow us to embark upon commerce and build upon our ancient trade routes and customs. Indigenous saltwater people have a deep and ongoing connection with our coast and marine environments. Through our elders, our rangers are well positioned to ensure that much of our coast and marine ecosystems are managed, especially in the most remote parts of Australia. Our rangers monitor the health of these special places and ensure that they remain in that way. In many places around the nation, they are the only source of management, harnessing two sets of knowledges, Western science and traditional knowledge, and practice to monitor and respond to impacts, threats, and to seize opportunities. I see great opportunity on the Indigenous estate, including in vast marine and in its tidal areas. I am reminded that Indigenous Australians had this country's first international trade, a long-standing arrangement between Indigenous Australians and Macassan fishermen to our north, many hundreds of years prior to European arrival, trading tree pang and sea cucumber in exchange for metal, cloth and other valuable items. So I believe that we have trade in our DNA. And in closing, Indigenous people look forward to being central players in the development of Australia's Sustainable Ocean Plan to ensure recognition, equity and inclusiveness as well as building on the long-standing traditions by the world's oldest living culture. We also look forward to collaborating with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in other countries that are signatories to this important commitment. Thank you and a big SO to everyone. Terrific, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, and then our, uh, our next, our fourth topic is ocean knowledge. And our speaker on this will be Dr Andrew Johnson, who's CEO and Director of Meteorology at the, at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, so to you, Andrew, um, how can a deep understanding of the way the ocean works uh, help make Australia and our region more resilient? Yes, thanks, Phil. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, like my colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that, that I'm on here in Brisbane. I'm actually sitting right on the boundary of uh, the country of the Turrbal and Jagra people, which is the Brisbane River, really important feature in the landscape here that was essential part of the stories and, and dreaming of, of those people for millennia. So I, I pay my respects to them. And also, as Joe did, acknowledge my uh, fellow panellists. Look, I just wouldn't mind setting the context for my remarks between a bit about the Bureau very briefly. It's a marvellous organisation that I've got the pleasure of leading. And Bureau is one of the few organisations uh, in this country that touches the lives of uh, almost every Australian uh, every day. And in this last year, we've delivered over 200,000 weather forecasts, over 150,000 weather warnings, over 2 million forecast products for the aviation industry. We've had over a billion unique sessions on our website 
and just under 500 million sessions on our app. And of course, I think you're probably wondering, well, what? that's all very nice, Andrew, but what's that got to do with our oceans? And I think probably for most Australians, when they think about our weather and climate, they think about the atmosphere. I think most people see it that way. In actual fact, the Indian Pacific and Southern Oceans play an enormously important role in driving Australia's weather and climate systems. So our capacity to forecast the weather and climate is inextricably linked to our understanding of the oceans and the relationships between the oceans, the land and the atmosphere. And as Joe said a minute ago, that connection then back to our community. And so over the last 40 years or so, our capacity to forecast the weather has improved dramatically. So just for, by way of example, our forecast, our five-day forecast that we have uh, today are as accurate as what our one-day forecasts were in 1980. Uh, 20 years ago, we were able to forecast the weather on a five-kilometre grid every six hours, but we could only do it for Sydney and Melbourne. Ten years ago, we were able to do that, uh, that same thing that we could do for Sydney and Melbourne, for Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, but not at any finer resolution. Yet today, we can provide the forecast on a one-and-a-half-kilometre grid for all our capital cities, and we can update that every hour instead of every six hours. Uh, all of this uh, enormous change has been driven by advances in science and technology, especially supercomputing. But it's also been uh, driven by better observation of the environment. And this is where the ocean story really comes in, and it's really, really important. Uh, every day in the Bureau, we assimilate into our numerical weather prediction systems an enormous amount of observational data, not just from Australia, but from around the world. So, for example, every day we assimilate over 900,000 observations from the Earth's surface, about a million and a half observations from the atmosphere, and 36 million observations from over 22 satellites around the globe. And when you think about those 900,000 observations that we get from the Earth's surface, only about 250,000 of them are from the ocean itself. And so we know that of those ocean observations, particularly those that come from ships, uh, ships of opportunity and buoys that are floating in the oceans, this is a huge driver of our forecast skill and accuracy. It's in our top four. So you can see that despite knowing comparatively very little about what's going on in the oceans, it makes a huge difference to our forecasts. And we know if we can have better forecasts, then this will make a huge difference to our farmers, our pilots, our fishermen, our mariners, our water managers, and importantly, to our defence forces and to our emergency services. So if we can invest more in observing and understanding our oceans, it'll undoubtedly keep our country safer and make our industries uh, more important. And also this understanding, I think, and this really cuts to a couple of comments my colleagues have made in their, in their comments earlier, this understanding, I think, can also support one of the great transformations in modern human history that's now underway, and that's the transformation of our world energy system. So, Phil, if I could just finish on a little story here, a little vignette about the oceans, the weather, and our energy systems. Now, today we know that the weather plays a really important role in demand for electricity as well as its supply. For example, we know that increases in outside air temperature have an exponential increase in demand on electricity. Uh, but, you know, a really detailed example is a typical air conditioner consumes about 25% more energy at 38 degrees than it does at 25 degrees to maintain the same indoor temperature. The difference of a couple of hours in the arrival of an afternoon sea breeze in our big cities, particularly in the cities on the East Coast, has a huge impact on energy demand and this has really big implications in terms of how much en uh, energy generation capacity is needed to be brought online to ensure that there are no power blackouts. The weather also has a big impact on the efficiency of high voltage transmission lines and substations. We get really big losses on hot days when the air is dusty and or, and or when the wind is blowing or not blowing. So as we move to an energy system that's driven more and more by renewables, the weather and hence the ocean becomes even more important. So, for example, this is probably obvious, but the timing, extent and duration of cloud affects the performance of solar generation. Solar panels become much less efficient once the temperature goes over 30 degrees. Wind turbines have maximum speed limitations uh, from, from a wind perspective, but more importantly, rapid changes in wind speed can have big impacts on the stability of the electricity grid and in certain circumstances can damage critical infrastructure. So when you think about in the last uh, few weeks and months uh, that renewables have contributed about 50% of the capacity in our system, and in some places on some days, uh, for example, in South Australia recently, where the whole state's energy demand was met by renewable energy, 
And when you think about the forecast growth in renewable energy, you can see how important the weather and hence the oceans will be to the future of our energy systems. So just to sum up, when you think about it, the last great transformation that we saw in uh, human history was the Industrial Revolution and the, and the development of modern society as we know it. And a lot of that transformation was driven by uh, the fundamental shift in our energy systems, driven by coal and hydrocarbons. My view is that the, uh, this great transformation that we're involved in now to renewable energy will be driven by the weather. The weather will be the fuel for the future and hence by implications, the oceans are going to be right smack bang in the middle of that transition. Thanks, Phil. Terrific, Andrew. Thanks very much. And our final final speaker, um, before we move to questions, will be Rich Gilmore, um, who I share some affinity with. I, I like the ocean and am a terrible fisherman, as Rich describes himself as well. Uh, but he's going to talk about ocean finance. Uh, he's the founding principal of 730 Capital. Uh, it designs profitable investments that deliver benefits to people and nature. Um, so, Rich, uh, to kick off to you, what's the role of finance in creating a sustainable ocean economy that helps both people and the planet? Thanks, Phil. Like Joe, I'm on Wadawurrung country today, a little bit, probably a bit north of Joe. I'm up near the headwaters of the Mount Emu Creek on the ancestral lands of John Robinson. And the uh, Mount Emu Creek then flows into the Hopkins uh, and down to where Joe is if he's on the coast uh, somewhere. And I pay my respects to that. Elders, uh, past, present, and emerge, past, present, and emerging. And I'm delighted to say that Wadawurrung people will, I'm here at the farm, Wadawurrung people will be on country uh, shortly for the first time in 200 years doing a cultural burn uh, of the native grasslands on the farm here. So uh, delighted that that's happening. Uh, to your question, um, Phil, I think there's three ways in which societies most readily express what it is they care about. And that's through the laws they make. And the minister mentioned uh, before about marine protected areas and the prime minister referred to uh, Australia's excellent record of fisheries management. And we elect uh, politicians, we choose politicians uh, to make laws for us. Uh, and that's one way that we express what matters to us. The other uh, is through uh, the expression of our shared cultural values and beliefs, our behavioral norms. And, uh, Joe referred to before the spiritual nourishment uh, that people and country mutually derive uh, from the ocean. So, so how we uh, express ourselves, what we care about, what we do, you know, how we behave um, when nobody's looking. And the third one is the one that you, you asked about, and that's what we spend money on, uh, how we invest. We collect taxes from our citizens and we choose how to spend those taxes we choose how to, what to buy ourselves and we choose where to invest uh, our capital. And so those are sort of three ways that we express what we care about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the finance one, but if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to show you one diagram about the scale of the opportunity that we're talking about today uh, in Australia. This is, let's think about Australia's ocean estate alongside its agricultural estate. We talk a lot about a $100 billion agricultural economy and a wide brown land and how important that is uh, to Australia. But let's look at these two uh, assets at their actual scales. If you think about the breadth and depth of the agricultural estate and its productivity and the breadth and depth of the Australia's ocean estate and its productivity, this is the scale, remember, the ocean provides a mind-bogglingly enormous investment opportunity and productivity opportunity for Australia. Depending on how you measure it, it's somewhere between 2,000 and 10,000 times bigger uh, than the, than the potential of the agricultural economy. And we talk about a, a wide brown land, as I said, and that doesn't look so wide in this context. It's still pretty brown, though. Um, and this is also true of our neighbours in the Indo-Pacific. So Fiji, Palau, Micronesia, Melanesia, Timor-Leste, we refer to these places as small island states or developing island nations. What they actually are is large ocean states, large ocean nations. These small specks of green steward and manage huge areas of blue and they have massive uh, abundant wealth that just needs to be tapped and can be tapped. So there's this huge sort of productive uh, opportunity from the ocean. And there's also 
a huge financial uh, opportunity. The, the total well, the world is a wealthy place. Um, total wealth on, on Earth, investable assets globally this year passed 550 trillion US dollars. That's a five with 14 zeros. So the world is a wealthy place. We have enough opportunity and we have enough capital to move the needle in the direction of a sustainable ocean economy. We just need some smarter tools and the will to do that. And I think one of the best ways that Australia can do that is to leverage the things that it's already good at. The minister mentioned before marine protected areas, marine uh, spatial planning, fisheries management, you know, responsible coastal development. These are all things that you know, uh, Australia is good at and can be combined with the things that Joe talked about, which is the many millennia uh, of sustainable use and extraction and trade of our oceans by Aboriginal people through the implementation of a fairly intuitive process developed first by the Nature Conservancy and now implemented around the world by traditional owners and others, which is the concept of development by design. And that's a process by which we collectively identify what it is that we care about. What do we care about economically, socially, naturally, culturally? And what are those things that we really want to invest in protecting? And what are the threats to those things that we care about? How are we going to prevent, as the minister said before, pollution, plastic getting into the ocean, climate change, coastal erosion, all of those things that go to threaten what it is that we care about? And then, as I said before, what are we going to choose to invest in alongside those laws to realise the scale of that opportunity? It's a fairly intuitive process, um, but you take the things that you care about, press to those things, stop doing those things and invest in the things that we do want. And that's how you start to get a sustainable ocean economy at scale in Australia for its Indo-Pacific uh, neighbours and for the rest of the world. The opportunity, as I said, is mind-bogglingly enormous, both financially, ecologically, culturally and socially. And we have a unique opportunity in time in Australia and with our neighbours to capture that opportunity. And I look forward to discussing with my fellow panellists in more detail how we might do that. So thanks, Phil, and back to you. Terrific, Rich. Thank you very much. OK, well, everyone did pretty well. Keeping on time there, so we, we'll, th we'll throw open to questions. We've got quite a few already uh, backed up, but um, I'd like to start, if I could, uh, to, the, to the Minister, uh, Ms Lee. It um, was a question from um, uh, an aquatic veterinarian called Matt, Matt Landos. Um, he's noted, as have some other people following the summit tonight, that the, um, the IUCN has downgraded the outlook of the Barrier Reef to critical uh, in, the, in the last 24 hours or so. Um, on top of the climate pressures on the, on the reef, we've got, um, you know, you know, mining, uh, agricultural runoff, uh, you know, the, 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 the byproducts of, of resources, gas port dredging and so forth. And despite everything that's been said and done, we're still, you know, we're still, we're still losing uh, the health of coastal waters and losing seagrasses and stuff like that. And what Matthew wants to know is, will the government consider creating a valuation or pricing system for impacts of an array of pollutants so that finan financial market mechanisms could be implied. It could be applied to restore coastal productivity, and maybe Rich, you might have a view on that as well. Um, thanks, Phil. And it's true that the IUCN World Heritage Outlook report that's been released, while it isn't the official arbiter of a final World Heritage assessment of the reef, uh, I'm certainly. Um, uh, aware of the important contribution that it makes to our understanding of the state of conservation of all world heritage properties. But it, it does, it reflects what we've seen with our own eyes over the last 12 months, you know, um, coral bleaching, unprecedented bushfires in the Gondwana rainforests. But it also reflects the significant work that Australian governments are doing to manage our world heritage properties. In fact, we are front and centre of helping create the methodology by which you assess what, cli what impact climate change has on world heritage property. So I'm trying to give you the sense that this is something that we're participating in, that we're aware of, and we're working to build the resilience of all of our world heritage properties, many of which have actually received some quite good marks, if I can put it that way, um, under this particular report. The reef is 
critical in terms of the value that it adds to our national and international understanding of marine ecosystems and it is indeed a natural wonder in its own right and I'm optimistic about its future. You talk about seagrasses and blue carbon and mangroves and there is methodology that exists to, if you like, uh, buy abatement under what Angus Taylor is doing in the Climate Solutions Fund and the Emissions Reduction Fund prior to that. So we do have ways of abating carbon in a formal sense. Um, work needs to be done, as I understand it, and I'm interested, Rich, in your thoughts on this, in actually calculating the methodology around the sequestration of carbon in secret seagrass and mangrove systems. As I understand, it's four times what it would be in uh, plantation trees. Um, but once we get that right and we work with farmers, reef managers and land managers up and down the coast, which we're already starting to do, and of course we're doing it internationally with our international partnership on blue carbon. Um, you know, I agree, Matt, I think it is, that there's much work that, that, that can be done that we're sort of poised to really start to invest in. You don't, you don't. You, you wouldn't consider a pricing system as Matt does to ping, um, ping look, people for polluting the look, waters. Pricing systems are managed by the Clean Energy Regulator. They're not technically in my portfolio, and I think that the way we should approach this is, uh, you know, encouraging the right practice and recognising that if we work with seagrasses and mangroves, you just produce such an overwhelmingly positive benefit that um, you should be able to calculate it and you should be able to factor it in. Rich, you want to add to that? Or? Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with the central um, proposition of, of Matt's uh, question. We will want to put negative prices on negative externalities and positive prices on positive ones. So we want to incentivise people to invest in natural capital markets and the health of uh, the ocean and the health of uh, terrestrial landscapes. And also I think it's reasonable to expect that we would um, you know, penalise those, you know, who, you know, would seek, you know, inadvertently or deliberately to harm those things and, you know, put a, a price on carbon, I guess, would be the, the, the global analogy. But we can also uh, relatively simply put prices on uh, nutrient, uh, a cap and trade for effluent from the Great Barrier Reef captains, for example. We've put a cap and trade in place in the Murray-Darling Basin and with some, uh, you know, exceptions around implementation in particular uh, places, the Murray-Darling Basin is looked upon by the rest of the world uh, as a flagship program for managing water policy. And its central tenant in the, the, in the Murray-Darling Basin and the Murray-Darling Basin plan is a cap and trade in which the cap is steadily reducing over time. Uh, and so absolutely we can apply that uh, thinking map to the oceans, price those negative externalities and incentivise people to invest in the positive ones. And we do, of course, have water quality regulations which relate to the nutrient runoff into the reef. I mean, my point is we've got to do that with farmers, as we've done in the Murray-Darling Basin, not to farmers, because if the people who, whose farming systems practices contribute to the negative externality, as Rich describes it, they need to be brought along for the journey. So, you know, there are regulations, reef regulations, so there is, if you like, some um, price point. Okay. Um, we've got a lot of questions on, on sustainability and, and, and overfishing, both in our own waters and, and internationally. Do, before I go to some of them specifically, David, could I ask you, and possibly for my own benefit, as I uh, only have a very basic knowledge in this, but and perhaps you sort of, um, Dr Reichert as well, um, can, can you sort of, I guess, estimate the impact of overfishing? I, I, we read and see stories about enormous fishing fleets from China, uh, Russia, Japan, you know, scouring the globe and, and just hammering fish stocks internationally. What sort of impact is that happening and for how long can we put up with that before it reaches some sort of critical point of no return? Yeah, you taking that one, Russ, or is that me? Uh, I'm happy to make a quick yeah, comment. Yeah, Russ, um, yeah. Well, I've learned a lot about a thing called Global Fishing Watch in recent years. Um, and it was a Canadian friend, Tony Long, and the people working with them at ANCORS, which is Wollongong University in Australia, who are really good at what they do. Um, and and they're, they're, they've done a lot of work analysing the extent, and three plus billion people rely on seafood as their primary source of protein. 34% of the world's major commercial fish species are overfished, and um, 23 billion of seafood is stolen annually from the seas through illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. Now that 
thankfully, Australia has, has does manage 100 per cent in terms of surveillance and um, behaviour of uh, illegal vessels. So we're fortunate in that regard we can do it, but the capacity to do that isn't everywhere and there is massive losses of benefit to local, uh, local communities. Uh, it can be at coastal scales in places like Indonesia and parts of the Pacific. Um, and there, there, are, there are numerous distant water fishing fleets that do the wrong thing, but it's only some of them. And the approach that Global Fishing Watch is taking is, is to boost dramatic, we call it radical transparency. You know, they, they have now through machine learning, um, incredible uh, improvements in satellite technologies uh, and cloud computing, they, they are getting better and better at identifying the bad behaviours and also the good behaviours. And the good behaviour would be something where your fishing catch is known and documented through a, a sustainable, uh, a, a transparent supply chain, a blockchain, or whatever you want to do, um, like uh, OpenSC that Austral does. So you want transparency and you want the information available to, and then support, and Australia does support the Pacific in this considerably, um, the capacity to enforce the uh, economic zones so you do capture the benefits and illegal fishing is is uh, one of the one of the uh, aspirations of the uh, high level panel was to end illegal unregulated and re unreported fishing in, in the Indo-Pacific region you know that, that because that's that was the focus of our special workshop on it so look that gives you a scale of problem answer um, in terms of um, the rest of your question, I've now forgot it, Phil. What? what, oh, what can, David, can pick it up. Jump, just, jump. Yeah, jump yeah. What, what's, what's the what's the sort of the outlook based on the current trajectory of uh, these enormous fishing fleets in, in global waters? Uh, yeah, I think I think the issue um, it's kind of complex and nuanced a bit. So in um, in first world economies like our own, where we have science and resources, and as I said, property rights that align the interest of the operator with the expectations of the community, um, things are pretty good. There's, there's not a lot of mystery around how you need to operate fisheries. Um, where things get unravelled is when you're in jurisdictions where resource, resourcing for compliance and enforcement is low, where science is in, um, inadequate and where borders are weak. And... Um, and tragically, that's the uh, that's the majority the majority of the uh, the national maritime estate, the international maritime estate. And um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the productivity lost, and again the numbers aren't uh, quick to mind, but they they they're they're very significant. And our own experience shows that fisheries that have been overexploited are um, are producing in terms of values a fraction of what uh, their potential is. So if we get that right. And, and particularly for countries like Australia, if we're able to assist in those jurisdictions where uh, capacities are low, then um, the upside can be uh, can be really, really significant. Okay. Well, just one more on that topic before we move on uh, from Catherine Breyer. Um, she, she says that in the Oceans Panel's blue paper, uh, the, the future of seafood from the sea, that was the name of the paper, it stated that we need to double seafood production between 2010 and 2050 levels. Uh, and, and she's asking if our oceans are overfished by as much as 33%, how do we meet this object objective to feed a growing population? I guess it's asking the question a different way. Are we, you know, are we just, is it an impossible task without, without change? Uh, so I'll, I'll just make the observation that um, uh, uh, I'm in the I'm in the hunter gatherer mode, the wild the wild fishery sector. So uh, we have some years ago passed peak wild catch, if you like, um, or at least wild catch is generally stable. Most of the, the aquaculture production is now uh, most most new fisheries production is coming from aquaculture, and we haven't really talked about that much today. And I'm not really super qualified, but um, are very significant opportunities for uh, upside in um, improving utilisation and management of wild fisheries, but equally um, some uh, big gains still possible from uh, smart aquaculture. Can I buy into that? Sure. Yep. Um, we talked a lot in the panel discussions about a thing called non-fed aquaculture, which are things that uh, grow without feeding. Uh, meaning algae, seaweed, incredibly valuable in, in, in many cultures and, and applications, and shellfish, 
uh, things that filter. And, and uh, as a quick aside, it, it was the loss and dredging of shellfish in places I grew up, like Moreton Bay, a hundred years ago, for lime for cement, not for eating, um, that uh, radically altered the water quality of those bays and estuaries. They're still beautiful, but they were pr pristine uh, because of the shellfish reefs that are now gone. And, and um, Minister Lee talked about helping this budget in this budget to put them back. So I was thrilled to hear that. But going back to the the increase. Um, when, when we did the Atlas in 1993 of Australian fisheries, there was 247 species of um, f fish taken uh, commercially and recreationally to eat. And I was explaining this to the Minister of the day, that um, we, we eat about four species of animals on the land, chicken, pigs, beef, and you, you name the rest. Sheep, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, and, and that's by necessity because uh, so essentially in the ocean we're eating our biodiversity um, and, and a lot of fish, there's only a few fish that are ideal for creating, um, they're farmable and they, can, and, and they can generate a lot of protein for people to eat. Um, the challenge is to do that without pollution and, and drift off of chemicals and, and excess nutrients. So when we talk about sustainable aquaculture, that's the proviso, that you do it without harming the ocean. And one of the ideas would be to mix into that non-fed aquaculture. And the reason I'm a fan of that is that I worked with Timor Leste, Indonesia, uh, in programs um, about 10 years ago, uh, getting World Bank grants to, because you can also, you don't need a $10 million facility to, to grow seaweed. You can have two boys and a rope and you can harvest it and a village can earn a living from it. So look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of, I, I like that, proposal in the blue paper, how you do it uh, would require Rich Gilmore's financial skills, Joe Morrison's cultural skills and Dave Carter's commercial nows. And I'd like to bring Joe in on this one as well as, and, and perhaps the Minister of, um, to our own, our own fisheries, our, our own coastal waters and our own, our own, our own management. Um, we don't, you know, we have different, different uh, regimes, the states tend to set their own, you know, their own, their own bag limits, size limits, they, their own rules. Um, even marine parks, uh, you know, in New South Wales recently, the state government just removed a marine park around Montague Island and off the south coast. That's been quite controversial. In South Australia, we've seen now a complete ban on snapper fishing uh, for three years because the, the stocks have been completely overfished. Um, we've had questions from several people that there seems to be a lack of consistency in fisheries management um, and why couldn't we just have a federally, uh, a federally um, you know, run system? I'm suspect you're about to use the word federation, Minister, but, <laughs> but Joe too, um, given, given the expertise of Indigenous peoples and, and, and as you said, 65,000 years of knowledge, um, what could you bring to the, the management of local fisheries? You, uh, indigenous people perhaps teach governments a thing or two, so we're not, we don't have these ad hoc processes and, and these problems. Oh, maybe I could go to Minister Lee first and then you, Joe. I'm really interested in what Joe's going to suggest uh, because maybe it's something that Commonwealth and state governments could adopt together. Now that we've got the transformations document and the commitment, I'm in the process of writing to state ministers to say, um, I'm sure you also would agree that your fisheries need to be 100% sustainable and you know, we, we, we'd like to partake in, participate together in demonstrating that. So yeah, there is that frustration between what happens in Commonwealth waters and what happens in state waters and an awful lot of fishing does happen in state waters. But I am seeing quite uh, look, I'm seeing a patchwork around the country, to be perfectly honest, with some states quite forward-leaning on this and some maybe not so much. So without wanting to call any of them out, it, it is a challenge of the Federation. But over to you, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, my experience and history, um, you know, the Commonwealth has always played a, a substantial role in Indigenous peoples' involvement in uh, the management of any natural resource, really. And so from our experience in Northern Australia where... Uh, you know, there were questions about uh, sustainable harvesting of, of particular species by Indigenous people. Uh, you know, we took the view that uh, it was Indigenous people who were best placed to be able to undertake management of those uh, resources. And so, uh, you know, decades of excluding Indigenous people out of uh, 
management arrangements, both by state and, and former federal governments, have led to a, a real disjuncture. So I think uh, it's really important to have the, the, the federal government or the Commonwealth government play a leadership role in that, uh, but also bringing along uh, the state and territory governments and ensuring that Indigenous peoples are part of the, the decision-making process around around that. Uh, as I said earlier in my in my remarks, that Indigenous people have got close connections to many of these uh, species uh, that people may not uh, think about, Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islander people having connections to. And so there's a sense of obligation that uh, that we have in relation to making sure that there's sustainable management of them. And that, uh, you know, that goes to the, to the heart of uh, why Indigenous people should be included both here, but also in other parts of the world and why Indigenous people have been calling for those kinds of actions. Um, and, you know, from my experience in Northern Australia, Indigenous rangers and traditional owners are, are the people in the most remotest parts of our country's north. And, uh, you know, there's no one else that's going to be managing these stocks. It is going to be Indigenous people, um, Indigenous people both at a management level, but also ensuring that any impacts, whether it's uh, climate change, and we've heard some comments in the chat there about dieback in the Gulf uh, of mangroves. Uh, you know, it's Indigenous people that pick those things up and they also are very well placed to be able to come up with solutions for them. So, um, you know, it doesn't really matter in my mind whether you're in Southern Australia or Northern Australia, there is a real great need to uh, take a collaborative and partnership approach uh, with uh, any uh, future management arrangements. Does it, does it, and anyone can jump in here, but does, does this sort of suffer from politics, you know, state, federal rivalry, uh, partisan politics? I mean, over the years, there's been competing pressures, you know, certain you know, MPs trying to look after constituencies and ask, arguing against marine reserves and, you know, tensions between Labor and the Coalition. Is that, is, is that noticeable outside of this place? Well, I think the landing of our marine parks package where we effectively went from paper parks to managed marine protected areas has demonstrated that we've resolved a lot of the issues with sustainable fishers, commercial fishers, recreational fishers. And, but I'm not saying that's a, a, a job completed while we still have state managed fisheries. Um, recently I revoked the East Coast inshore fin fishery which is Queensland, um, but the opportunity for me to do that was because of migratory species within that fishery, and that gives us the CITES convention lever to say, OK, this is not being sustainably managed. But the next step, of course, is really very much Queensland's. But Joe makes an extremely good point about the people who are there and understand the local environment. So. I think there's work we can do with the states involving Indigenous people, particularly in northern Queensland and the north. So I'm going to take you up on that, Joe. One of the things, I, as the non-expert here, is just how little we know about the ocean, um, you know, compared to how much, probably because we can't see it, um, you know, but beneath the surface, compared to you know, our general knowledge of the land. Um, and one of our one of our followers, Ian Dutton. I think ask a very good question, very simple question. Maybe, Andrew, you'd like to take this one first. But he says, there's some great initiatives described tonight, but there's also a need for a greater emphasis on ocean literacy uh, if we're going to build a constituency for change. Would you agree with that? You think if people out there actually knew just how complex and important oceans were, you know, in terms of the currents, the, the temperatures, what lives beneath and so forth, that there may be, we, we may be able to engender a lot more support. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. I think in the psychology of, of certainly uh, certainly not traditionalist or first Australians, but certainly for for those uh, who've been around here for the last uh, two hundred odd plus years, the the ocean is not not embedded in our DNA and our psychology. Indeed, for many years, it was seen as a as a place where we dump things rather than an essential uh, part of our life support system as a nation and an essential part of our uh, of our being as a nation. So. So, no, I think uh, there are huge opportunities there to, to develop deeper understanding. You know, tonight, my comments, I just focused on one tiny piece of it, which is sort of the, the physical understanding of the ocean, but deep understanding of the ocean's biology, the ocean's chemistry and the interactions between all those things are just uh, so important, Phil. So I think there's a huge opportunity because I think when you look at, I don't know, 80-plus 80, 80 percent of our population within, lives within about 30 kilometres of the coast, 
So there's this deep physical connection, but it doesn't often extend beyond the horizon. So what's that? About eight kilometres. Uh, mm. So it's really a, a connection with the coast, which is somewhat different than a connection with our ocean. So great opportunity there to do that. And I should, if I, if I may, um, Phil, today yes. I signed off on my department delivering Australia's first ocean accounting pilot. So what that does, it took 12 months to get there, so well done for those who are involved, using accepted methodology to measure and calculate seagrass, reefs, kelp and fish life in the Geograph Marine Park, which is just south of Bunbury in Western Australia. So what that will do is actually help us paint the picture because as with everything to do with the environment, you need a baseline, you need the data, and you need to know the direction you're heading in. And we've got to give a shout out to Citizen Science on the Reef. So it happens everywhere. People are taking the photos, sending the information. It gets checked, doesn't it, Russell? So yeah, that, you yeah. know, it, it's it's actually real and, um, and contributes to... citizens science. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Contributes to the, you know, eyes on the reef. It, it's how the whale sharks were discovered off the east coast of the reef. You know, we, we thought WA had them all until people started taking pictures of these big animals surfacing. Mm. They're off the reef as well. So, yep, yeah. that was the eye on the reef. Yeah, and I think the advantages of the internet and social media are just transformative, that there are so many valid sources of knowledge that can be brought to bear to how we manage the oceans. And is it just scientists uh, and the traditional sources uh, of scientific knowledge that have value? So I know in our, in our own system, we, we ingest every day hundreds of thousands of uh, bits of weather and climatological information from ordinary citizens on their on their phones that are transmitted in real time to help us do the job. And there's no there's absolutely no constraint on that fuel being extended into the ocean environment uh, for the for the benefit of the nation. So I, I think there's huge opportunity, huge upside there. Terrific. As a as a, as a recreational angler, I've, I've learned a lot just just myself. But um, <laughs> sort of know how to catch them. Though. Um, We've got a lot of questions on, on energy, on ocean energy, um, but um, about there, there's some criticism that it doesn't really feature in the in the renewable energy roadmap as a, as an alternative. Um, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of focus on it at a government level. Um, I wonder, Rich, and then maybe the minister and anyone else could talk to that. Um, exactly what is ocean energy? Um, how viable a technology is it? Um, and are we making a mistake by overlooking it? And if so, what are the economic and environmental advantages if we do, do harness it? Well, our technology investment roadmap has a level of being agnostic about the types of results that we're going to see. But I do want to stress that it's significant and we will guide the development of $18 billion of government investment between now and 2030. So that's through the bodies that you're probably familiar with, CEFC, ARENA, the Climate Solutions Fund and the Clean Energy Regulator. So that in itself drives an, at least $50 billion of investment through the private sector and state governments, 13 130,000 jobs by 2030, many of them in regional areas. So I just want to underscore that significant investment in new technology. And the roadmap was released in September, uh, and it also includes links with low emissions technology statements, both locally and internationally, and does include five priority technologies. I'm not suggesting we're picking winners. I, I don't know that much about uh, tidal energy and energy from the ocean. Um, there's no reason why if it could not be proven up and take that next step. So, Rich, you might be the best person to give us the technical intel. Um, not sure about the, uh, the best, but um, innovation is not linear, uh, and that includes in energy. So in, in renewables, like conventional renewables, you know, solar and wind, we were scratching around there for a couple of decades trying to get it to scale and then you get to an inflection point and all of a sudden South Australia is 100% renewable. Um, and Andrew mentioned before that, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution. I think the scale of the economic transformation that we necessarily are going to embark upon makes the Industrial Revolution, post-World War II reconstruction, you know, dot-com boom, the technology transformation pale into insignificance if you think about the quantum of the transformation that we're undergoing. And so every renewable source of energy is going to have to be invested in and scaled. And that includes ocean energy. I'm not technically uh, proficient on it, but you know, this year, something like two and a half um, thousand gigawatts 
of energy was installed globally just in the ocean, just, just from ocean wind. That's not even taking into account currents. So I'm very, and that, none of that was in Australia, of course. There's one project proposed off the south coast of uh, Victoria, between Victoria and, and Tasmania. Uh, so they were a little bit, um, you know, behind in this area, but the ministers mentioned, you know, what a uh, commitment the government is making to uh, renewables. I think Ocean's Energy's day will come, um, but we've just got to understand that it's not a linear process uh, and it'll get to scale when the market is ready. And I guess the point is that it's not for the government to decide. I mean, we've picked five areas under the technology investment roadmap and they're most likely and most, if I can say, proven up and hydrogen people are pretty excited about. So um, we've also, um, as I understand it, in the budget invested about $4 billion to look at not how we would build offshore wind, but how we would regulate it and get it into the grid and obviously managing the grid and the stabilisation of the grid was also a significant investment when you have to match that with renewable energy. Andrew, you might know more about um, ocean energy. You're nodding. <laughs> uh, I, know, I don't, Minister, but I, I'm nodding because I agree with the comments that, that you and Rich have made. I, I think um, uh, th there's huge prospectivity for ocean energy in this country and it'll, it'll be for government, industry and community to work together to to navigate what are the most appropriate interventions that make the most sense at the at the at the right time, and and we've got tremendous science and technology capability in this country to support that happening, and uh, you know I, I think as as you and Rich have said, uh, it will scale and it will scale uh, rapidly over the next few years. Because right. there was there was some experimentation with tidal energy in WA about a decade ago, but it's yep. I'll just to, to build on the back of those type of comments that um, I can see uh, the scale we, we can't imagine, but if you think of the flow on effects of uh, having a lot of uh, renewable energy to process say new metals uh, to um, the new new methods of hydrogen uh, treatments of iron ore for instance or um, abundant electricity for aluminium smelting we, we export 40 percent of the world's alumina and four percent of the world's aluminium because we don't make much aluminium here so th these are sort of what I meant by exponential changes you know that as rich said that, uh, that these things have a way of snowballing and creating other opportunities for for, uh, that are you know, a bit disconnected from the ocean economy, but, but it, some of these things are hard to... You've got to see the whole picture, and once we hit that scale, um, it, it will be... Um, it, it, it has a positive runaway effect. Uh, David, I'd like to throw to you, just because most people who use the ocean are recreational, either fishing or swimming or so forth. You've been fishing all your life. Um, and I've got a question from Benita Brown, who's a, one of the hundreds of thousands of recreational anglers in this country. Um, and she says, can we brief, can we acknowledge how they think the rec, rec fishing community can self-manage? Um, you know, it, is it time to give a nod to these anglers who understand, you know, to the knowledge they've gained, what's happening above and below the water? Um, do we need to put more investment towards fish habitat to help the average angler make a difference? I guess what she's asking is, we've got tens of thousands of people out on the water every weekend in this country, can we harness them and the knowledge they've gained and you know, how can they contribute to sustainability of fish stocks and, and our knowledge going forward in terms of management? Yeah, uh, good question. The, um, uh, we have a shared interest for and love of the ocean. Um, uh, slightly, slightly oblique to that was um, some discussions we were having about what could be done with marine ocean plastics, for example. and. Um, uh, and the, uh, the whole <clears throat> the whole plastics uh, kind of yeah, how, how can we reduce that and the, the the scourge that represents? But the idea that we could collaborate, so recreational fishing and um, and commercial fishing to look at um, some of the plastic cleanup work is is classic. So you've got people that are out there; they're enjoying that environment. There's that chance to um, to find bits and pieces that are floating and pick them up and um, same as we do in um, ghost, gear, gear, ghost gear recovery and the work that um, Minister Lee spoke of earlier is some some uh, uh, bits that we've done with um, in around that gove area. <clears throat> um, in a fishery space, um, yeah, there were definitely interactions between um, commercial and recreational. That's often... That's often um, 
uh, it's not it's not part of our world particularly, but in on species where there uh, is overlap in pressure, then uh, I think that it's much better outcome if you have an agreed an agreed share of those resources uh, between recreational and and uh, commercial, and that they each respect and understand the role that um, uh, that each performs for for our society and the collective impact they have, and then. Um, and then take a, a co collective interest in ensuring that we're doing the right research and we're monitoring and adjusting pressures um, in accordance with uh, changing the, the changing observations we make of those resources. All sounds a bit, all sounds a bit geeky, but um, <laughs> the theory's all right. <laughs> you spoke about plastic, and we haven't devoted much time to that this evening, but it is a, it is a horrible, nasty problem on our oceans. Uh, especially in, in the Northern Hemisphere and out in the Pacific and so forth. Minister, um, I've got one question from one viewer. It's, you know, they welcome the, the investment that you mentioned in cleaning up pollution and, and the ghost nets in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, but beyond that, and could you bring us up to speed? Because the Prime Minister's had a lot to say about this at the United Nations last year. Then it all sort of fell silent a bit when you know, the government understandably became distracted with other issues this year, but where are we up to? What, what this uh, Adrian asks, what is the government doing to work with our neighbours to address the sources of plastic pollution and ghost nets, given the majority of this stuff is coming from outside Australia? Look, everything is still happening. There's no question that when I when you look at plastic, you look at, well, what's Australia doing? And noting that most of the plastic in the ocean comes out of six or seven rivers in Asia, uh, how do we help with addressing the issues that are not within our domestic control. But what we are doing domestically is really important too. So every weekend you'll see people picking up plastic, we'll, you'll see government funded community environment programs, you'll see education, you'll see recycling, you've got the Prime Minister's waste ban, so that plastic is actually not going overseas and ending up in someone else's ocean to drift, etc. So we're doing a lot locally, but of course the international dimension of the problem is massive. and. Um, we're, as I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're, we're supporting the Pacific and uh, we're helping them with what is an awful lot of plastic that arrives on their beaches. I think we will be doing more with the Pacific when we can uh, post-COVID. Uh, it's been a terrific partnership and remains so. And, you know, the, the technology that our Antarctic scientists, I must give them a bit of a shout out to actually understanding what's going on in the ocean. So when we talk about climate models, um, so much of the understanding of the Southern Oceans comes from our Antarctic Division scientists. They are incredible and the IPCC relies on them. So they've been doing projects that have examined nanoplastics in the krill food chain. There was a bit of excitement a few years ago that perhaps krill could get rid of plastic altogether. Well, it's hardly likely to be the case. It just goes to a sort of piece of about one micron wide and still enters the food chain. But um, our scientists are part of that international collaboration. Russell, what you, you with your international focus might be able to talk about some of the things that need to happen internationally. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. It sounds like a, a buzzword, and it is circular economy. But what, it, what that's at the heart of it. But can I just mention the Pew uh, Trust Foundations that did a did a very comprehensive report, uh, and and it was quite disturbing news. It came out mid mid COVID sort of, so it, it, it thing overtaken by an even worse story. But uh, the current track, if we keep doing what we're doing, uh, and and progressed with clean up, we would by 2050 would have improved the situation by 7% or something. It, it, we're not on an elimination type path. But, um, but they had a list of things to do and, and it's kind of you've got, to, you've got to do all of them. And, and, um, and the first one was eliminate non-essential uses of plastic. We're overusing it for things. Uh, substitute plastics for alternatives that, that aren't um, as, uh, as polluting. You know, the, the, this chain from macro to micro to nano um, pico even, uh, tiny pieces of plastic, um, we, we essentially have to move off that and design ourselves out of using uh, the current sort of 
packaging materials. We'll still need things to wrap stuff in and bottle it and do things. So designing recycling, but we that so reduce use, as a, reduce as a use, yeah. design for recycling and friendly products, improve waste collection management. The minister mentioned, um, and and design for disassembly. All all Xerox office machines now are designed to be disassembled and totally recycled. For instance, so it doesn't end, it can be used again, and it's all about use not not um, consume, so the waste, there's avoid. no, avoid waste. Avoid first. I mean, well, that's we, easy for we, us to say, but a lot of it's developing yeah, countries yeah. And I think, I think swing everything the into the sea. Yeah. Because our um, national waste targets are all about, you know, the circular economy and using less plastic and, mm. you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're working hard, but I think the, the issue is that you've got to see the plastic that's thrown away in whatever country as something of value in order for someone to pick it up and to put it into a recycling process. So where that can be done in a modular sense, it, it actually does make sense because otherwise the plastic... I mean, we've, we did this in Australia with um, return and earn and we're still doing it in... It's been in South Australia, That's I think, for 40 years. Forever. It's only just coming in in Victoria. It hasn't Wonder. even arrived in Victoria. But um, but I think that's the key, to see it not as something you throw away, but Make something that has a resource for value. I was in South Aussie since I was a little boy. <laughs> it was a lot longer than 40 years ago. Um, look, we've got time just for one more before we wrap. Um, and it's coming from Anthony Cox at the OECD in Paris. Um, and also, Joe, you mentioned this earlier about the interconnectedness of oceans and lands. And there's also, you know... These things don't recognise borders, certainly the ocean doesn't. And Anthony's asking, the ocean doesn't stop at the boundary of our economic zone. You know, how, how do we, and this I guess could work with plastics and so forth, but how is Australia planning to work with its neighbours, its regional neighbours, to drive action for sustainable ocean? Now that could be, I mean, is it, is it does it come down to um, government, government relations and maybe, Joe, could we get more people to people uh, efforts going as well? I mean, I could give I could give some uh, examples, and I'm sure you know there's lots going on at a bilateral uh, level. But uh, you know, a shout out to uh, the Reef and Rainforest Research Centre in North Queensland that's been doing amazing work with uh, Indigenous people and landowners in, in Papua New Guinea using the sort of uh, ranger model that we've have here in Australia and adopting it there. And I also know that uh, many island nations in the Pacific uh, are looking at that as well to have more local people involved in the monitoring and ongoing management of their oceans and their forests and so forth. So, uh, you know, it doesn't directly answer your question, Phil, but I think there are, you know, varying levels of cooperation going on. Uh, but Indigenous to Indigenous, in, in my experience, as I've seen with uh, exchanges in Canada and other parts of the world, is extremely powerful to allow people to exchange and uh, work on concepts and find solutions that are consistent with what the bi bilaterals may be but are empowering people at a local level to, to act and be engaged. Phil, Phil Richie, can I also suggest yeah, that, sure. that this, can I suggest that this panel uh, is one of those fora uh, that should, that is and will continue to be in doing that outreach. So as, the, as um, Russell mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's a head of state led, well, almost in Australia, prime minister led intervention Fiji, Palau, Indonesia, Australia are all on it. Uh, and this is a great forum, I think, to start to have a lot of those conversations. And I think that gives us the opportunity to give a shout out to, you know, the department, Susie Heaton, Paula Parrott, Russell, the minister, and everybody involved in Canberra on, on convening, you know, this panel. I think this is exactly what it's for. You're nodding furiously there, Andrew. Did you want to say something? Or no? Learning for me is not to not not to not so much, yes, Phil. But no, I agree with that. I, I think it's a, it's a zipper. I see it as a zipper. It starts with you know, basic interaction, people to people, all the way up through to head of state, and uh, and uh, both in the vertical, but also in the horizontal, using bilateral and multilateral mechanisms to make that happen. It's all about partnerships and it's all about relationships. It's um, that's that's the future. And and you know, I think our ties, particularly with the Pacific. Uh, are so strong uh, for this nation and, and getting stronger every day that, um, you know, it's incumbent on everyone really, uh, particularly those of us who are involved in positions of responsibility to do everything that we can to, to uh, amplify and accelerate and deepen those partnerships um, going forward. So I, like, like many others, I think I'm optimistic about that uh, going forward because I think there are multiple mechanisms and uh, terrific goodwill and mutual interest involved. And David, would you like to jump in before we wind up? 
Anything else to offer on that? No, I'm pretty good. I was going to um, I was going to encourage the panel to think about who they could co collaborate courageously with. Wow, we love courageous collaboration, <laughs> David, and not afraid of it. But I think that Rich, you've 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 pointed to the future. So it's not just um, well, we've all come together and we've talked, and now we're all going back to business as usual. We're actually started something that will continue. So that's really a point, really well made. And thank you for thanking the department because they have done an amazing job in putting this together with everyone who's on the webinar tonight and everyone who's going to be there, you know. Um, in a streaming sense over the next few days. But we'll keep busy with this and we've, we've got the foundations of something important. Well, thanks, Susan, and, and thanks, everybody. I've, uh, it's been a very interesting session. I, I, I could actually ask a million more questions myself, um, but I, I think we'd all agree it's an enormously sort of difficult challenge um, we have over the years ahead to, to, to realise, I think, those, those goals that you laid out, David, by 2050, but um, he's hoping we get there. So, look, <clears throat> thanking you to everyone who joined us this evening and especially to our speakers. Um, so we'll wrap up now. If you, if you stick with us for the next few minutes, we'll leave you with a video of the ocean panel leaders talking about the importance of the ocean and their, individual, their vision for sustainable ocean uh, economy. So thank you again and good night. The ocean gives us life. It feeds us, entertains us, connects us, inspires us and powers our success. I grew up in a beachside suburb of Sydney and it was very often the case that I'd head down to the beach after school with my mates. It is so much part of our way of life. From an early age, uh, you learn how to swim, you learn how to fish. That's a very important part of our culture and tradition. Indigenous peoples have lived in harmony with our natural world and our oceans for millennia, and we need to draw from their expertise on how to better support and cherish and steward our oceans. We are sailors, we are fishermen, we are industrialists. We are dependent on the oceans. But today, the ocean's health is off track. At a time when we are already looking to recover from the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, we understand how vulnerable we are to health and other shocks. It's important that we consider ocean as a partner. Life on Earth as we know it depends on the health of the ocean. Research shows that a healthier ocean is a smart investment that will deliver social, health and economic and environmental benefits. The health of our Earth and the health of our people are linked. They're totally intertwined. Our vision is to find a balance between the conservation and the use of sustainable resources of the I believe we can choose a triple win, a win for people, a win for nature and our economy. We effective protection, sustainable production and equitable prosperity go hand in hand. The Ocean Panel, composed of 14 serving world leaders, has put forward a new ocean action agenda. Nous invitons à assurer une gestion durable de 100% des zones océaniques se trouvant à l'intérieur des limites de nos territoires. Listening to science, listening to research, listening to best practices that we have seen work for many other countries. Sustainable ocean action should be a cornerstone of national and global policies. Pengelolaan laut yang berkelanjutan akan mendukung pencapaian SDGs. We are looking for reason to believe that in 2021 and beyond, we can not only fix what COVID did to the world, but also fix the problems we already had on our plate climate change, pollution, ecosystem collapse, economic instability, unhealthy diets, poverty, and unsustainable practices across all sectors. The answer is a healthy ocean with sustainability at its core. Oceans may separate us physically, but they can also bring humanity together for a healthy, prosperous future. El esfuerzo por una economía oceánica sostenible y sustentable tiene que ser multisectorial y multilateral. 
We call on more world leaders and other partners to join us in turning the 100% goal into reality and treat the oceans as the solutions for the future. The ocean gives us so much, let's give it 100%.